it's kind of cool that the scripture says that he lives in the praises of his people. People wonder, where is God in my life? He's right there in your praise. <laughs> you see, so when, when you just do something like that, he's right there. You don't have to wonder where God is. He inhabits our praise. Mm. I sort of don't want to go on. <laughs> um, but I, but I, as I contemplated this time and this season and, and uh, this day, uh, I feel like the Lord gave me something to share with you. Um, I, I, I have spent my career as an educator uh, in the public systems, um, but just as valuable a role to me as, as I serve with uh, four gentlemen and the pastor and the leadership of this church as elders, Tim West and Eddie George Hoy and Sean Woodall and I are honored to serve uh, as elders in this house. Um, we all, we, we've talked about it over time, we all have different functions um, and all of us have different, if you want to call them anointings, um, but it's an honor and a privilege to serve uh, in this house. It really, really is. And to see what God is doing in your lives, uh, we do pray for you quite a bit. Um, and we, we count it an honor to do so. I want to say this publicly. We did ask Pastor to consider uh, every year taking a month away from the pulpit to rest and to pray and to and to be um, a husband and a wife and not just pastor because pastor is 24-7. You, you understand that, right? You may not call him uh, this week. You may call him next week. But somebody out of 600 people, somebody's always got a need, okay? We take stewardship in this house very, very seriously. But stewardship is more than money. Stewardship is the gifts that God has given you. How are you stewarding them? And we as elders, and I know that you do too, believe that, that is a, he is a gift. He and Kathy are a gift from God to us. And we want to steward them well. Okay? We, yes. So, uh, that's why this season comes. And uh, when he asked if I would share... I'm happy to do it because I consider it part of my stewardship of his giftings, okay? So we're going to turn to Mark 8 and 22. Um, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. If not, they'll put it on the screen for you. If you're new here, um, they'll put it on the screen for you. But I, when I ran across this recently, I was uh, working with someone who was stuck and they were having some challenges, and they called and said, I'm going to be in town. Uh, would it be possible for us to um, meet and let's talk about uh, some things? And uh, as I shared with you, Lori and I have spent the better part of our married life now um, studying what we call freedom ministry, but just helping people see what they can't see when they're stuck helping them see how they're stuck and why they're stuck and moving on. And this scripture in that night of meeting and praying and prophesying and praying and believing with him, this scripture came to me, and um, as I contemplated today, the Lord said, I want you to take that scripture, and I want you to share these things out of it, okay? So we're, if, if now, full disclosure, as I said, I spent my career teaching middle schoolers. So my mindset tends to be a little different than some, okay? So look at your neighbor and say, oh, my. Yeah, because um, middle schoolers, to me, are the most precious things in the world because they don't know all the goofy stuff that, you know, a lot of people know, and they haven't experienced all the goofy stuff that a lot of people experience. So they're fresh, and they're new, and they're just asking questions all the time. So my mind tends to be asking questions all the time. If you look at Mark 8, 22, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged 
Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes. See, that's a middle school thing. See, the middle schoolers would have been going, cool. Jesus spits. Spit on the man's eyes. Jesus asked him, do you see anything? Do you, do you see anything? Do you see anything? Do you see anything? Do you see anything? I don't know how you ask it, but there's a bunch of different ways you can ask that question. He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. No spit this time. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything Clearly, Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you gave it to us and that you have things to say to us. Now, Lord, I pray that you would say those things in the way that you want to say them. I pray that we would have ears to hear what you want to say to each of us. I pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying in Jesus' name. Amen. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. So so here's my thoughts about that. Bethsaida is this town. And you know towns have reputations. When I say the word New York City, you have a mental picture of what that is. Let me throw another one at you. Las Vegas, right? Neon lights. How about this? Nashville. Twang and country music, okay? Cities have reputations. So you may not be familiar with this reputation of this city. It's a little fishing village, but let me just give you a snippet of the reputation of Bethsaida found in another scripture in Matthew eleven twenty one and 22. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for them on the day of judgment than for you. The reputation of Bethsaida is... Lots of things can happen in there, but nobody believes. Ain't nobody believing what's going on. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Look at this. They came to Bethsaida, and some people, I love the anonymity of this. Some people, wasn't his mama, wasn't his daddy, wasn't anybody really that even knew him. Some people brought a blind man. Now listen, there are some of you in the house that, understand intercession. For those of you who don't, let me put it this way. There are some times when God's going to come to you and say, I want you to pray for this individual. I want you to intercede for this individual. That's an anonymous activity. Don't expect somebody to come around and say, oh, I'm so glad that you prayed for me because blah, 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 blah. Sometimes it happens, but sometimes, most of the time, it does not. Some people brought this man to Jesus. Some people, listen, if you're called to pray for somebody, don't go around saying, yep, I'm called to pray for that person, so I'm going to pray. Let me pray. Let me pray. Oh, God, let me pray. Just pray. Just pray. And don't worry about doing this. I'm praying for that person. If you're an interceder, an intercessor, just do it because you're going to see what happens. Now, let's say you understand intercession, and you get it, and you, you just do it, and you don't worry about the pats on the back. I want to encourage you this morning to watch what happens with this situation because somebody said, you know what, I'm going to own this. I'm going to pray until. I'm going to pray until, and I'm going to, now watch this. Look at this word. Brought a blind man and begged Jesus. See, we want to say, Jesus, just touch him. 
Thank you. Amen. Jesus, here's this blind guy. Do, so, do what you can. I'm walking on. I got people to see and places to go. I ain't got time for this. Some people, this anonymous group of people, said, you know what? I heard about this guy, and he's over on the edge of town. And this blind man has been sitting here for a long time. Why don't we get up off of our hind backsides and take this guy and move him in the presence of this guy and beg this guy to make something happen? Well, I don't believe I can do that. Well, you could if you wanted to. If you're desperate enough, you'll take somebody. Listen, this guy needed a miracle. And some people were willing to say, you know what? I'll be the one. I'll be the one to take it. Here we go. They took him and begged Jesus, asked him, pleaded, prayed. There's a sense of desperation here. That word begged. I'm begging. See, we've been tainted a little bit. We see all the news reports about beggars, and they're really making six figures, and they're out on the highway, and they look all drab, but they got all this money. But that's, that's not this. They're begging because something needs to happen. They begged him to touch him. See, that's really all it takes. Because when somebody comes in the presence of Jesus... You are worthy, are worthy of your name. When you come in the presence of Jesus, a touch can do amazing things. Amazing things. It can heal. It can restore. It can bless. It can anoint. It can do a wide variety of things. Just, the, just touch him. Just touch him. We're begging you, Jesus. Just touch him. Intercessors, the thing I want to say to you today is don't quit doing a good thing because ultimately there's going to come one of those times when you say, Lord, I'm, I'm bringing it again. I'm bringing this person again, and I just want you to touch them, and it happens. And when it happens, there's no denying it. There's no ignoring it. It's a powerful thing. Now, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Why did he lead him outside the village? Well, my middle school mind says this. Ain't enough belief in that village. There's a whole bunch of junk going on in that village, and he needed to get that guy away from his surroundings. I, I've watched. I'm one of those seniors, Pastor. Thank you for that reminder. You know, I, I come to church here every week, and I see this young crew up here, and they're doing all their stuff, and wasn't worship good, and they're so awesome, and I see these two get up here, and they look like Ken and Barbie, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dear Lord, I have become the old guy. I don't have ripped jeans. I don't have skinny jeans. I ain't got funky shoes. I just, I'm the old guy. But I've watched people over now my years and working with people who are stuck. And there is a sense that Jesus comes to many of them and says, I'm going to touch you, but I need to take you out of the village that you're living in. I need to move you away from those circumstances and situations and and because there's just not enough faith right there and I'm going to move you and they get upset because gee they 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 they're in this wrestling of they know that they hear something saying get on up out of there stay out of the bar stay out of this place go somewhere different but that's where they live and that's where they've been all of their lives. And Jesus is saying, you can't live there anymore. You got to get on up out of there. If you're going to receive something from me, you got to move. He led him out of the village. 
Because Jesus knew the reputation of the city. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Now, as, as near as I can research and look at, this is the most curious healing event that I see in the Gospels. Nowhere else do I see Jesus saying, did it work? I'm sorry, middle school mind, but when I read that, that's, that's, that's sort of how I pray. Lord, I believe you for healing. Lord, I, you know, now, Jesus is Jesus, and I'm quite sure that isn't what he meant, but that's how I interpret it, Russ. He lays his hands on him, spits in his eyes, and lays his hands on him and says, How's that look? Now, Jesus really, he, he, he's the God of all the universe. He knows what's going on. But that's, it's, it's just weird to me. It's just weird that he asked that question. And so I really pressed God about that because my mind's sort of middle school, and uh, God's a little higher than that. And so I said, God, what, what's happening here? There's a couple of things here. And until I got to digging in it, I didn't understand. But that word for eyes... Is uh, it's it's a different word than is used later in the text. It's the word in in the Greek that means the physical sight, uh, the the ability to see accurately, the ability for. It, it, okay, how many of you can relate to this? Better A or better B? Better one? Better two? Anybody relate to that? Okay. The rest of you have no eye problems and haven't been to the eye doctor in years. The truth of the matter is you need to go because you don't know that you can't see. Right, honey? Years ago, we're driving down the highway, and she says, one of those big green signs comes up. She says, baby, here's our exit. I said, how do you know that? She said, the sign says, I said, you can see that? She said, you can't. I didn't know I couldn't see. So listen. The, when he spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? Do you see anything? Do you see anything? Do you see anything? Now, here's where, in my opinion, we drop the ball. Because we go through a worship service, Pastor Russ, and we get a little tingling in our spine, and we feel a little anointing, and we feel God touch some sensitive place in our heart, and we, we feel that, and we, we get a little excited about that, and we feel the hand of God move, and, and we, we're, we're thrilled by that. And the Holy Spirit comes to us and says, I appreciate that you're excited about that, but can we talk about this deep thing here? We say, oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't really want to be a fanatic now. I don't, I don't want to be crazy. You know, that whole reading your Bible every day and praying, that's a little over the top, God. Can we just do the once a week thing? It's all right with me. God, I, you know, I, I, I don't really, I, you know, uh, I don't really want to be honest about where I'm at. I really don't want to be honest that I'm not really seeing because I know. That, listen, here's another thing we say. Oh, this Christianity thing works for everybody else but me. It doesn't really work, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fake it. I'm going to fake it. I'm going to act all Christian. When they sing that special song, I'm going to sway Everybody in the room going to know I've got the anointing of God on my life. And I feel Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh. 
Ooh. And we fake it. Now listen, why am I saying that? that? What could that man have said? Well, if he was one of us, he'd say, yeah, I see things fine. Thanks for the touch. I'm back. I, I appreciate the spit, all right? I'm good, though. Because you know what he's thinking? If he were you and I, he'd be saying, Lord, if I say I'm not seeing things right, he's going to spit on me again. I don't know how I feel about that. If we will dare to be honest with God, instead of faking it, we can find a little freedom, a little joy, a little peace, a little goodness, kindness, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All that stuff can be growing in our life. But you know what we do? We get a little touch. We get a little excited. Oh, young people, we go to camp. We get a little Holy Ghost. Ooh, that feels so good. And then we never follow through. We're happy about the touch. But we don't know that there's healing waiting around the corner. We're satisfied with the touch. We're satisfied with the spit on my eye. We're satisfied with a little attention from Jesus. But we don't want to follow through all the way and be honest and say, you know what? There's still things in my life I'm not seeing accurately. No, we don't want to do that. Why? He might have spit on us again. It's going to require something else, a next step, a next level, a next, next. So I'm just going to be happy with the touch. I'm going to be happy with the sight. I don't really need accurate vision. I'm going to be happy seeing things as I see them with my own bent and twist because, after all, that's my personality. You know where your personality lives? Your personality lives, all right. The flesh, the old man is dead. Y'all remember this? The new man is alive, and inside in between is the flesh, and that's where your personality lives. It's been trained by the old man. So if you're going to live by your personality, guess what? Your personality is God's working to kill it. So you can become more and more and more like Jesus Christ. Do you see anything. And the man dared to be honest. Think about the courage this took. This man, Jesus, oh, he's, he's heard about this guy. One touch from this guy and it heals everything. One touch from this guy and everything. Lame men walk. He's raised the dead. Blind eyes see. What's wrong with me? It didn't work. Huh? Huh? What's wrong with me? It didn't. Everybody else brags about the blessing of God in their life. What's wrong with me? Everybody else gives and look, they get, you know, they get uh, uh, money just coming into them. You know what happens to me when I give? God gives me a job. And I get paid for that job. I'm not one of those that when I give, it automatically comes out of heaven. Hallelujah. There are people like that. Where's Eddie Joy Hoy? That man, I'm telling you, when God tells him to give, God goes, Bruh. me? He says, Eddie, I'm going to give you another job. You make more money, it's all right. Listen, it takes courage to admit to God that what you need is not yet. It doesn't take any courage to say, yeah, bless God, he healed me. No, he didn't. Not yet. He touched your sight, but you're still seeing men like trees. Here's, here's the value of that. Again, I'm willing to admit I'm the freedom guy, and I believe everybody needs a little freedom. The vast majority of issues that we have are not with money. They're not with buildings. They're not with cars. They're not with stuff. They're with people. And when you don't see people accurately, you got problems. Because you're going to interpret those people through the lenses that you use. And if you see people as anything other than the creation that God made them to be, you're going to be bent and twisted. He 
he looked up and said, I see people. I, I do see people. They don't look right. They don't look right. At least he was honest enough to admit that he was bent. He still was not healed. He'd been touched. He had sight, but he didn't have correct vision. And listen, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells us so. There's no sin in not waiting for the fullness of what he wants to do. But there sure is disappointment. And there sure is, hey, Russ, this is called a handkerchief. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. I felt so bad. I didn't have one last week. I had to run up here and give you one. I see people. Now, there's a couple of things I see here. This man hadn't always been blind. How do you know that? He knew what trees looked like. Right? So, I'm going to say this slowly. Something had happened to him to make him unable to see people accurately. Now listen, if you walk this earth very long, people are going to lie, cheat, steal, be unkind. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, it's impossible that offenses won't come. And again, Lori and I work with people all the time, and they say, well, I just, this, and it, it's always about people. It's not about events. It's not about um, but they say, this person hurt me, and I can't seem to get over it. Do you know there's only one way to get over it? And that's with the healing from Jesus. He saw people as trees. You know, he could have just said, yeah, I'm seeing fine. Thanks for the touch. But he had the courage to say, Essentially, I appreciate the touch, but I'm still not where I need to be. <clears throat> How often do we sell short what God's trying to do by being satisfied with less than? Don't satisfy your flesh. Don't settle for Incompleteness. Can I tell you something? He will be called Jesus, for he will save the people from what? From their sin. They're missing the mark. Their shortcomings. He is ready, willing, and able to completely heal Every aspect of your life, if you're willing to be honest. Once more, Jesus put his, man, his hands on the man's eyes. Now, the interesting thing here is the writer uses a different word for eyes. We see it only as eyes because that's our limited language only shows us that. This is the word for vision, not just sight, but vision. Can you see out? Can you see into things beyond just seeing what they are? He says he put his hands on his vision, not just his eyes, but his vision. You know, there's, there's, uh, I, I like to talk. Um, everybody said, amen, good Lord. I like to talk to people who are experts, and anytime I go to the eye doctor, I just love her. She's brilliant, and she, and she talks a lot about the neural processes of seeing, and that seeing really is a multifaceted. It's not just this piece right here. It connects to nerves and 
the brain in a special place. And there's, there's such a thing as seeing but not interpreting correctly what you're seeing. That's what Jesus now touches. He could see things, whereas before he couldn't see. But now Jesus says, we're going to go in and do a deeper work because I want you to be able to interpret what you're seeing accurately. A person who hurts you by lying to you will not suddenly and miraculously stop lying to you. But you can interpret their actions accurately according to the kingdom and begin to pray for them that they will become a person of truth and honesty and it ceases to impact you. Once more, he put his hands on the man's eyes. A deeper healing takes place so that he can see men, not as trees, but as they truly are. Listen, if you can see people as they truly are, as Jesus sees them, boy, that's tremendously freeing because then you stop judging them. Remember what Jesus said about judging? Judge not lest you be judged. For the the same measure you judge, you're going to be judged. I've laid that down because I used to judge people a lot. I ain't doing that anymore because I don't want to be judged that way. I was too harsh on people. Everybody had to be perfect. Now I just want people to be people, not trees. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. To me, that's a definition of freedom. That's a definition of really receiving a touch from God. When you can pray honestly, Lord, help me to see as you see. Help me to see that ex-husband or wife as you see them. Help me to see that boss who has been on my last nerve as you see them. Help me to see that co-worker who I think is a little lazy and I'm working harder than. Help me to see them as you see them. Help me to see that child who is on my last nerve jumping up and down a middle schooler, and I cannot do it one more day. Help me to see them as you see them. You start seeing things the way God sees them, it's a whole new life. It's a whole new existence. But you continue to see things the way you see things, you're going to be shaking hands with a lot of trees. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? People are not what they present themselves to be. You checked out Facebook lately? My life is perfect. Look at this vacation. My life is perfect. Look at this precious dog I got. My life is perfect. Look at this little video I made of my cat. That ain't life. That is not life. Life is gritty. Life is life, but you can see life with the eyes of the Spirit and live above the cat videos. You don't need the cat videos to make you happy because you got the joy of the Lord in your heart. You don't need the precious little dog video to make you giggle because you're looking at things and going, oh, God, I love my life. Now, last thing. Jesus sent him home saying, I need you to hear this. I'm not a, I'm not a horror movie fan. I, I, I don't enjoy being scared. But I've, I, like I said, I've taught enough kids and they come in with stories about the scene in the horror movie where everybody in the, in the theater saying, don't open that door! Right? 
Because there's a boogeyman behind the door that's going to eat you or axe you or saw you or do something to you. Don't open that door. Again, this whole story is very curious to me. He looks at the man who he has touched, and now he has healed, and he says to him, look, I, I pulled you out of the village, and I need you to understand that you, you, you can't go back into the village. You can't go back into the village. I, I don't really... This is all the middle school mindset I'm free and willing to admit. I don't know what, why Jesus said that. Here's why I think he said it. You've just gotten to the place where I've touched you and I've healed you, and you can now see people accurately. But if you go back there and you see some of those same folks, you're going to start rehearsing the same way you used to see them, and you're going to fall right back into the same old patterns, and you're going to struggle if you go back into the village. But if you'll stay outside the village and let the healing really sink in, and let the healing really take hold, and, and your flesh becomes renewed by your spirit, man, there will come a day when you can go back there and you can do great work. But now is not the time. I told you, I, I've, I've dealt with young people for, for a long, long time. And um, I, I served, uh, I almost said I served my time. That's not, um, I was glad and grateful to be a youth pastor at one point in my life. <laughs> and then the Lord moved me into public education because uh, he called me to be a missionary. Okay, And um, so I began to see, Pastor Russ, the kids um, come out of their summer experiences, right? Come out of their summer highs, their summer, really the touches of God on their life. And they would come back in. And by Christmas time, they were struggling, right? Because they really struggled because in their spirit, they didn't solidify the, 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 the healing. Listen, I get it that it's not practical for, okay, God healed me. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to quit that. And I'm just going to. But listen, your spirit man has to. Your spirit man has to stay in a place to receive what God is giving you and downloading into you and imparting to you. you Friday afternoon. Friday, Friday night is date night. Lori, Lori cares for her 89-year-old mom seven days a week, 24-7. And so Friday night we have a sitter come in. We're grateful for it, and we go out, okay? So <clears throat> I was so excited because I like date night because she makes my socks go up and down. And... And so, Friday, Friday afternoon, you know, um, I'm so excited, and I've, I've wrapped things up, and I'm getting things going. Lord, don't let me curse Microsoft. So, I shut my computer down. How many of y'all know what figure happened? Do not shut down. Your updates are taking place. And the spinning circle of death comes upon... That machine. All you Apple people are saying, yeah, we don't have to deal with that. I don't want to hear it. Five minutes go by. She texts me and said, you left yet? I said, no, I'm waiting on Microsoft updates. Ten minutes go by. Did you leave yet, sweetie? I'm like, oh, she's killing me. When she calls me sweetie, it really makes my socks go up now. And so then... 20 minutes later, thank you. It put me in the right frame of mind. Oh, hallelujah. All the way home, I had to pray. Listen, there are times when we have to know that we know that we know, God, I know you're doing something. I know you're working. I'm, I'm not real clear exactly what it is, but I know you're doing something, and I'm willing to wait and see what you're doing because you need to download into me a different way of processing information. 
Because the way that I've had is not accurate. It's not getting me to the place that I need to be. As I close today, 